give to you at this time our brother, our warrior, our teacher, Kwame Ture. Well, we wish to thank you very, very much for such a very warm welcome. Our, our attempts to come here has only been delayed because of all the work we have to do and because of the tyranny of time. It's a tyrant time. Osaji folk, Wami and Krumah used to whistle all the time. So many beautiful things to do, so little time. But we are honored after a long struggle that we're able to come to the slave. A young man said to me, yes, I said, I'm going to go to the slave tomorrow night. I said, yes, sir. He said, are you tired? I said, even though I'm sleeping, I just got to go to open my mouth because the slave has a base of conscious people who come there. <laughs> so going to the slave is not a task for me. It's very easy. This task, which we're involved in, the task of conscious raising of the masses of the people, must be properly understood. Each audience which you come before is not the same audience. But our task is raising consciousness. And in some audiences, the level of consciousness is much higher than it is in others. This is a fact. At the slave, you have many activists, many activists, you have people who I have known over three decades. One of the good things about life would be a quote that I would steal from Martin Luther King. He used to say, longevity has its rewards. <laughs> and I used to think, I'll never live to get any of them. <laughs> but as life would have it, he went before me. You never can know, he's a lucky one. He goes at 39, becomes a hero. You stay around at 52, make errors, and even have your mother scream at you. <laughs> We're at the slave and extremely happy to be here before the United African Movement and its leader, Alton Maddox. We have followed closely the work. Here in the All-African People's Revolutionary Party, of which I have the honor of being a Central Committee member, we have many, we have Central Committee members here in New York who follow closely the work of the United African Movement. As a matter of fact, we have present in the audience two members of our Central Committee whom I have a great pleasure of introducing to you. One is Sister Mawina Kuyate, and the other one is... And the other one is Brother David Brothers, who is 75 years young. <laughs> Where's David? <laughs> so in New York, they follow very closely your work. We're in constant contact with them. We speak with them. Even though most of our work is public, do not think for one minute that we are not working. As a matter of fact, the press just ties you up. Our work is done quietly and effectively. One of the rewards of longevity, I happened to see tonight, when Sister Rose Sanders took the stage, I said, well, I remember that little young girl in Selma when she just got a tooth on struggle. <laughs> I remember when she just got oh, oh, full of fire. I said, well, some keep the fire. For others, it goes out. She's kept hers. It's getting brighter. And she represents the real true, the real true history of struggles in this country. The press would have you believe that most people who struggle, after they get tired, they sit down. But the slave is a testimony to the lie of this statement. Most of the people here have decades of constant struggle behind them as a history. <laughs> Thus, we are never confused by the press. Never. The press represents the capitalist system. And the capitalist system does not lie some of the time. It lies all of the time. All of the time. When it tells the truth, it's a result of a double lie. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. 
<laughs> it's a fact. <laughs> we are very proud to be a slave. Thus tonight, unlike our discussion in other areas, we would like to give you an update of what we've been doing. Now, I want to tell you in the very beginning, our early introduction to struggle was through the, non, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Here, our task will go into little towns in the South, quietly infiltrate ourselves into the towns, find the strongest Africans there, willing to sacrifice their lives, build a base from them until one is able to take the town. Here, the press is really an enemy. So since my early days of work, for my people, I could not use the press, and in my later days in struggle, I understand that one should never depend upon the press. This is extremely important, and as we give you an update on the work we've been doing, the work we've been trying to do to advance our people, we will show you the relationship of the press to our struggle. We say from the very beginning, Unless you don't control it, don't ever think it's your friend. We say from the very beginning, since you don't control it, when you deal with it, you must know you're dealing with an enemy, and therefore you fight it as an enemy, and you make the enemy work for the masses of your people. We want to bring you some updates on the question of identity. You know, it's crucial for a people whose culture has been destroyed. If one doesn't know who one is, one really cannot know what one's interests are or where one is going. That's right. That's right. This fact can be properly understood. If after you've entered the theater tonight, the slave, when the meeting is over, you forgot even where you live, you're in serious problems. <laughs> you're in serious problems. Right. There's always understanding where you come from, where you must go, and who you are are crucial for all people, but especially for an oppressed people. Indeed, the first job of the oppressor is to wipe out the culture of the oppressed and have the oppressed believe that they have the same culture as the oppressor. All right. All right. His job is to have you think that you have the same history as the oppressor. Once he thinks that you have the same history, once you think you have the same culture, you will think that the enemies of your oppressor happens to be your enemies. Once you know your history, once you know your culture, you will know that the enemies of your enemy must be aided to bring down your enemy. This has to do a lot with the question of identity. Now, we must tell you in our analysis, we do not make the errors that others do. Anytime you make an analysis of an oppressed people in any aspect of their life and you leave out the enemy, you will never come to a correct analysis. On the contrary, you will blame the oppressed for all of their problems. Therefore, we tell you from the very beginning, we've never taken the line of others that the biggest problem that we have is we ourselves. No, our biggest problem is our enemy, capitalism, and it must be destroyed. We say any analysis you make of an oppressed people must include the oppressor, otherwise you will come up with an incorrect analysis blaming the oppressed for their position of oppression. Even if one were to talk about the drugs in our community, if you just talk about drugs and not talk about the enemy, you make no analysis at all. Or well, you may sound serious saying about, well, you know, the trouble with our kids is that all they're doing is fighting for drugs and shooting each other and shooting each other for drugs, and I wish they would stop. If you haven't brought in the question of who brings the drugs in, why the drugs are brought in, for what purpose they are brought in, you will never understand the problem at all. Thus, we make it clear to each and every one, when we speak of the conditions of the African masses, we begin from the very beginning with the enemy of the African masses, all unjust system that seeks to exploit us, capitalism, and especially the racist capitalist system in the United States of America. It is this system which comes to confuse us as to the question of identity. Go into any Italian community, ask all of them what they are. Each and every one of them will tell you without responding, Italian. Go to any Polish community inside this country, 
Ask from the little youngest to the oldest one what they are. Without blinking an eye, they will tell you Polish, each and every last one of them. Go to the Palestinian community here, which is still not free. You'll find Palestinians born in America. Ask any of them quickly, what are you? Without blinking an eye, they will tell you Palestine is not free, and I'm fighting to make it free even in America. Go to Africans who've been in America longer than all of them. Go to Africans who came here under conditions none of them came here under. All of them volunteered to came here, went to get visas to get here. Look at the Africans who didn't ask to come here, who were brought here against their will, who should hate America and should be the last to claim they're Americans. Ask them, what are you? I'm American and proud of it. And if you say something against it, I'll kill you. They say the job of the enemy is to make you identify totally with the enemy. Even if we call ourselves Americans, they don't treat us like Americans. They don't treat us like Americans. We have built this country and they shoot us down in the street like dogs and somebody's still holding on to them, but we Americans. There's nothing in America for us except exploitation. There's nothing in America for us except exploitation and oppression. Ask any of us, and if you have a thousand of us in one room and each, ask each of us what we are, you get a thousand different answers. Of course, you and the slave know what we speak of. We are forced with the same problem here. The problem is through political persuasion, through constant discussion, using nothing but the truth to let our people know exactly what they are. Africans. Nothing more, nothing less. <laughs> nothing more, nothing less. Of course, as we pointed out over and over again, this question of not wanting to be an African is based squarely in ignorance. The enemy keeps us ignorant, not haphazardly, but by calculated plans. Go and pick up any textbook that you have that you had as a child. Go now and pick up the textbooks that your children have. The only time Africa is mentioned is that she gave slaves to America and that the slaves who came in Af from Africa to America should be very happy because the price of slavery and the oppressions of America is better than the barbaric life which we lived in Africa. Thank you very much, America. Uh -huh. These are facts. You will read in all your textbooks about all the great things the Germans did. The contribution of the French to world humanity. The contribution of the British to world humanity. The contribution of the Italians to world humanity. But Africa, no contributions at all. We say in the very beginning, the struggle here begins with a fight against ignorance. But this fight against ignorance must be properly understood. Not only does the enemy make you ignorant, but then he makes you want to love ignorance and hate knowledge. Right. Hate knowledge. Take any unconscious African. Hey, brother, hey, sister, what's happening, African? I ain't no African. Well, I know you don't know nothing. About, I know you ain't no African, but would you like to read something about Africa? What's that going to do for me? And they think that when they respond to this, that they are really thinking. Right. <laughs> Taught by the enemy to react to stimuli, and in the act of reacting, they seriously think they are thinking. Right. <laughs> the task we have before our hands is a serious and difficult task. Right. But we are revolutionaries. We do not run from difficulty. We run to difficulty. We are African revolutionaries. We understand that man and woman only advances through confrontation with obstacles in their path. And the bigger the obstacles are, the more you knock them down, the more confidence you have that you can knock down any obstacle, especially when it's relationship to the struggle of the masses of your people. Are you there? Thus we tell them all, we of the All-African People's Revolutionary Party make the, make the revolution difficult for us. Put every obstacle in the path. The Africans in Trinidad, 
in their sing song English say, the rougher the water, the stronger the swimmer. <laughs> yes. Yes. The rougher the battle, the stronger the warrior. And your people need strong warriors. Your people need strong warriors. Therefore, we tell the enemy, we're not afraid of you. We'll face the people. This struggle of arriving at African is crucial. When one says one is a Negro, it sounds good, even with a capital N. And that's what they did to us, yes. <laughs> but after all, there is no such thing as Negro land. None whatsoever. This then is an invention of the master to put you somewhere hanging in space in history nowhere. So as a Negro, the only land you know is America. So, well, okay, what you say, you know, I wasn't born anywhere else in America. This is all I know. And da -da -da, uh -huh. The jump from Negro to black is important. Here now, you come to confront the enemy. So you think because I'm black, you're going to make me shame. Dig this. Nappy hair and all. I'm coming, and I know I'm beautiful. Dig that. Yeah. This aspect, then, of black is absolutely in advance of a Negro. But still, there is no black land. It is only when you arrive at Africa that you arrive at the proper conclusion. Because Africa is the richest continent on the face of the earth. <laughs> Africa's wealth is not to be found in her uranium, her gold, and her diamonds. Africa's wealth is to be found in the great contributions which we made to humanity in the area of morality, ethics, and humanist values. This is Africa's great contribution. We want to just pause a little about Africa's contribution. We usually give the one on religion, so many of you have heard it before, but it's important. It shows us so much. We say the enemy not only makes you ignorant, but then makes you lazy in your ignorance, make you enjoy your ignorance, and fight against any acquisition of knowledge. If Africans are excited about anything in their cultural life, it is their religion. We are a very, very religious people. Africans carry the Bibles under their arms everywhere. Going to their houses, you'll find copies everywhere. Go to church every Sunday, but never think of reading the Bible from cover to cover. Never think of it at all. Though they will swear that this is the book that dominates their lives. The Ab capitalist system makes them Christians, not have them read the Bible and let them think they're Christians. And who's giving them Christianity? A pimp who uses the pulpit to drive a Cadillac. And Jesus Christ wore sandals. He said, it's easier for a needle to go through, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man, any rich man, to enter the kingdom of heaven. And yet you will hear preachers who tell you, you just got to send me a letter and I'll send you a, I'll pray to God and God will send you a $20 bill. A true Christian can only pray to God to thank God for giving them life and continued strength in the day-to-day -day battle. We do not leave it here on this level. We say the enemy comes to confuse us. All our churches have white Jesus Christes, all of them. We speak facts here. Read your Bible. Read the life of Jesus Christ, peace be upon his name. His foot never touched any part of Europe, not even one square millimeter. Even in your Bible, Europe is not mentioned in the Old Testament at all. It's only in the New Testament, and here it's found near the end by Revelations. We say that Jesus Christ could not be white, but somebody painted him white. As a matter of fact, if you properly know the history of Jesus Christ, peace be upon his name, you can say that Jesus Christ can be just about any color, but the one color he definitely could not be is, oh, you know it. <laughs> A few days
days ago when speaking with a sister, she told me, Brother Kwame, I have a lot of trouble with Christians. I said, no, you shouldn't have trouble with them. She said, yes. She said, I went to this Christian. I just told him about Africa. They told me, get out of my face. I said, she's not a Christian. Any Christian must respect Africa. Every Christian must respect Africa. The first country mentioned in the Bible, Genesis 2, verse 13, Ethiopia is in Africa. That's Genesis 2, verse 13. In your Bible, it might be spelled Kush. Don't get confused. When they say Kushite, they're talking about you. You are the Kushites. You will just go to any dictionary and you look at the word Kush, it will say ancient name for Ethiopia. Kush. When Jesus Christ, peace be upon his name, was in trouble, everybody wanted to lynch him, kill him, threaten his life. He had to run. Who gave him refuge? Africa. Where did he grow up? Africa. Where was the first church established? Africa. Where was the first monastery established? Africa. The very intellectual development of the church came out of Alexandria, which is in Egypt, which still is in Africa. We just mentioned briefly some of Africa's great contributions to Christianity, only in passing. As a matter of fact, I do not think, and I'm not certainly a student of the Bible, as a human being, I read the Bible, even if I'm not a Christian, I have to read the Bible because so many people call themselves Christians and are affected by this book. If I must deal with them, I too must know something about the book. I'm not a scholar in the Bible, but I'm almost sure that probably the word Egypt and Ethiopia appears in the Bible more than any other country mentioned in the Bible. We just like these facts to show you that if Christians were reading their Bible, being Christians who are also Africans, they would be doubly proud. Proud of what Africa has done for Christianity and proud as Christians that they can affirm what they are and show their beautiful image as their God, as they say, created them different for others for his own best understanding. The enemy will not only try to have you identify with him in every means, but he'll even try to make you look like him in every way. Uh, but your God is a mighty God. Your God knows what he's done. You may try to get away from your God. You may put everything you want in the hair that your God gave you, but time alone and God will bring it back to where it's supposed to be. <laughs> You do not think that we're not consistent. <laughs> if you wore your hair in a natural in the 60s, and then you come back and change in the 90s, don't think everybody else has changed. The reasons for which you wore it in the 60s are even more valid in the 90s. The struggle is an eternal struggle. The capitalist system will confuse you. Miriam McCabe was fond of saying that our people are just the now people. They want everything now. <laughs> if you tell them something for later, I ain't got no time for later. I want it now. Uh, capitalism makes you think that everything must come now. But the struggle in which you're involved in is the struggle in which you will not reap that which you've sown. You have already reaping that you have already reaped that which has been sown by past generations. You must sow for future generations to reap. I'm so tired of brothers and sisters coming and saying, when are we going to enjoy the good life? It ain't for you, it's for the next generation. Do your work now for the next generation. When you work for your people, it's not what you receive, it's what you give. And the best thing about working for the people is that what you really give for the people, sometimes nobody else knows except you. This is real struggle for the people. This is real struggle for the people. Thus, we must wipe out from our minds that the struggle in which we're involved in is going to give us any victories. The struggle in which we're involved in is an eternal struggle. We are not working for ourselves. We are working for generations to come. Therefore, what I've done, you ain't even begin to see. Generations later will come to thank us for the work we've done now. This aspect of understanding eternal struggle and understanding identity is tied together. The Honorable Marcus Garvey said it best. 
Africa, for the Africans at home and those abroad. Right. The honorable Marcus Garvey said it best. We must build an African empire which will protect us all. The honorable Marcus Garvey saw clear. But American capitalism will come to confuse you, filter your mind. Let you think that, oh, Africa is not so important after all. Africa doesn't mean this or that. Without Africa, none of us will be able to speak of freedom. We must come to understand how tied we are to Africa. That can be easily demonstrated quantitatively, not even qualitatively. We have spent at best in America some 500 years. Do you know that woman began in Africa? <laughs> Do you know how many years you spent in Africa? Before 500, matter of fact, 500 years is less than the drop of a grain of sand in the ocean when compared to African history. And the 500 years that we've spent in America ain't nothing but hell. You must really be confused that you want to give up millions of years of history, millions of years of development, millions of years of movement for 500 years of hell. Africa is our home. Africa is our only salvation. <laughs> Thus, since we are among conscious fighters, we just want to inspire you. Do not ever get tired of the struggle in which you're involved in. As a matter of fact, a true struggler becomes better every day at what he's doing. Years ago, it would take me a long time to convince a brother or sister of a certain point in the struggle. Now I can do it in two minutes, and I'm working to do it in two seconds. We must every day perfect ourselves, which we call the instruments of advancement. Every day, in every way. What I used to organize and take two weeks to do when I was 22 years old, working in Mississippi in the South, today, in any village in in Guinea, in West Africa, I must be able to do the same thing in two days. It is only this constant progress of we ourselves who are fighters. The fighters sometimes make the mistake of not seeing the necessity for them to perfect themselves as an instrument to help raise the conscience of our people. If you want somebody to follow something that you are telling them, which is a good advice, the best way to make them follow it is to be the best example of the advice you're giving them. In no way should this mean that if a liar is telling you the truth, that you should not accept the truth. No. The truth out of anybody's mouth is still the truth. And wherever you hear the truth, you must accept it. You must use it. The Chinese say, be not warned by the speaker, but the words that she speaketh. The Africans say, listen even to the enemy. He too can tell you the truth. This problem of going to Africa is very serious. It's a struggle, and the enemy knows it. And we want to show you how the enemy comes to work in every aspect of our lives. We must understand that power does not begin on the level of implementation. Some people take the mechanical definition of power as the ability to do and think that this is power. Power begins on the level of conception, not on the level of implementation. Right. Examples abound everywhere. If you are a math student, and you enter a math class, and you conceive, having proper conception, that Africa gave math to the world. Therefore, I'm an African. I can dominate this mathematics. I bet you if you go into a class with this conception, you'll dominate mathematics. But if you come with the conception given to you by the enemy, you know, math is hard for us Africans. You know, all we can do is play basketball and music. And uh, you know this math just ain't no good for me. The math will whoop you. The math will whoop you. Power begins on the level of conception, not on the level of implementation. That's why it is necessary for us to think for ourselves as a people, not to think like the enemy wants us to think or even trains us to think. Conception. Let me show you how the level of conception breaks down in political work. In the 1960s, we call ourselves Negro. Thanks to the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Thanks to the work of Markel X, we were able to jump from Negro to black in the late 60s. Right. You are all conscious workers here. 
all of you have been involved in this process because this is not a youth group to which we speak. Right. You know, when you think yourself as a Negro and when you think yourself as a black man, what a great difference there is. Right. Just in the level of conception. Right. Let me give you an example of how this level of conception comes to really show implementation. Let us say that we're given the task to organize African student associations on all the college campuses in America. There are two ways to endure the task. We can ourselves go to every college campus, divide up ourselves, and fight, fight, fight to put an African student association up there. But once black power has been declared and the conception has been understood, African student associations will spring up in every university almost automatically by themselves. This aspect, then, of conception is important. The enemy knows that when we went from Negro to black, it was a real problem. The enemy knows to go from Negro to black is harder than it is to go from black to African. The enemy must stop us from getting to African. The enemy must stop us. All African revolutionaries know that the cultural revolution is the most important revolution in Africa because the people without a culture have no cohesive force and cannot wage a proper struggle. And if the people are depending upon the culture of the enemy, they are finished. Thus, the enemy uses our culture against us. We went from Negro to black, getting ready to go to Africa, and he said, hold it, let's mess with the culture. He got some rap artists who have no understanding of life. They judge success of the people's culture by how they can rip it off and sell it to the white man, rather than how much they can use it to advance the people on the course of liberation. And then he pumped up all the airwaves. I mean, one thing about him, he gonna saturate it, you got saturate you with poison. They saturate you with poison. All over the mass waves, he got these little rap artists to disrespect us, disrespect everybody, and try to bring us below Negro. The enemy is working in vain. We are going to Africa and nothing can stop us. <laughs> Thus, we must understand properly the process here. These rap artists are only straw men. The fight is not with them. The fight is with capitalism. The fight is with the enemy that uses our culture against us. They are only collaborators in the system. Their, their role must be properly explained to them. But if you think you wipe out a rap artist, you've stopped the problem, you've made a mistake. You wipe out one, they'll bring ten more. Saying worse stuff than the ten before you just wiped out. We must be careful here. We must come to understand precisely our culture, and the only way we can understand that is when we understand where our culture had its formation, where our culture had its strength, where our culture can resist itself, and the only place it can do that is in Africa. Right. Clearly then, we will move off of this subject. Of course, more should be said on it, but we're before conscious strugglers. Our job here is only to encourage you on the path that you've taken to understand that your people have very few who love them, very few at this time who care about them, very few who are willing to sacrifice for them. And if you drop out, you are not only a disservice to your people, you are a traitor to the cause of your people. This aspect of being a traitor must be properly understood. Properly understood, in any country, a capitalist country or a socialist country, if the country is at war and you're a soldier and you go AWOL, you can be shot. In any country, if your people are at war and you say they are at war and nobody drafts you, you come to volunteer for the people. And you say you come to volunteer because the people in fair conditions, I've got to do something, and I'll be around here for a while. You're going to hear about me. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then the conditions of the people get worse, and you drop out. We have every right to shoot you. <laughs> what we say is serious. The enemy uses this against us. He takes the petty bourgeois elements of our people who've been involved in struggle in the 60s, make them drop out of the struggle and show them on the press everywhere. So people think, oh, all those people find in the 60s, they dropped out. I see before me a lot of people who I've known personally here involved in struggle and they're still here struggling. They ain't gone nowhere. As a matter of fact, they got better at struggle. Better at struggle. We continue then. 
This aspect of African must be understood. You must constant and be constant and be constant in your political education. The enemy doesn't stop politicizing us with all his vice. It is television, it's the same thing a thousand times. Buy me, buy me, buy me. Getting a woman to kick her legs up in the air. Buy this, buy that, buy that, buy everything. Always pushing vice. We come and say, Africa, Africa, Africa. And after a while, the enemy says, are we tired of hearing that African stop? Stop it. You ain't heard nothing yet. You're going to hear Africa till you die. <laughs> we do not surrender before any force that's opposed to our people. And we will not stop doing our responsibility. Our responsibility is to educate our people. Our responsibility is to make a people who have been made ignorant by oppression come to first love knowledge, to want to seek knowledge, so that they can understand it is only through knowledge that they can come to better the conditions of the masses of their people. And if we surrender before this, we have done ourselves a great disservice. In fact, we have betrayed the sacred cause of our people. As for us, once we've taken a step on the road, we will continue on that road until a bullet finds us, and if none finds us, death will only find us working for our people. We give you now some updates on our struggles. We want to speak about this process of politics, of bourgeois electoral politics. Because that's all it is. Any time to get elected, it depends upon how much money you got, you're playing capitalist politics. Right. And the United States of America, it's who got the most coin, gonna win. For Africans who don't have any money, it doesn't even make sense to get involved in this. Which of you in this audience do not know that the Democratic Party is corrupt? Which of you do not know that the Republican Party is corrupt? Which of you do not know that any African who enters those parties, they have but one objective, corrupt the African. All right. All right. Corrupt the African. We must look at history, Malcolm is correct, and we do not go way back, we just take you to 1966. Working as an organizer for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in Lowndes County, Alabama, right. a county which was filthy with racist terrorism, I mean, the racist terrorists there used to kill people just to let you know that they were around. Right. Lowndes County has a history of blood. When in 1965, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee assigned the task of workers there, I was honored to be among those workers. We came to Lowndes County. When we entered Lowndes County in 1965, there was not one African registered to vote, even though 85% of the population in that county were African. You must understand the terror of this county. I just situated for you geographically so you can see how terrible it is. Lowndes County lies between Selma, Alabama, where Sister Rose Sanders is speaking to you from, and Montgomery, Alabama. You know in Montgomery, Alabama, Martin Luther King started his movement in 1954. And the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee started a movement in Selma in 1960. And King had his famous Selma to Montgomery march in 1965. Thus, between Lowndes County stood Selma and Montgomery, which were seething with activity. But those terrorist groups told him, you leave that stuff out there. When you come to Lowndes County, you better start saying, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, and bow down before you get here. They didn't play. But we are revolutionaries. We don't play either. <laughs> uh, we don't play. <laughs> We talk, joke, and pick a lot of coke, but when you mess with our people, Jack, we don't play. We went in there and told them, we're going to organize these people and take the power from these pigs. I will tell you, if you look at the history, many were killed in that struggle. I will tell you, if you look at the history, houses were burned, people were tortured. I'll tell you, if you look at the history, you will see nothing but a war. When those Africans came time to vote, the Democratic Party came to present itself. At that time, the Democratic Party was run by George Wallace. You must know your history. You must know your history. Each Democratic Party in each state has its own state emblem. I know very little about the Democratic Party, but I assume the state of New York has an emblem for the Democratic Party. In Alabama, Georgia, in 1965, the emblem of the Democratic Party of the state of Alabama was a white rooster, a white cock, with the words white supremacy written over it. This was the official emblem of the Democratic Party of Alabama in 1965. How could it be that I, who have shed my blood for the vote, can invite my people to get into a party like this? 
One must have integrity above all. And one re when one represents the people's struggle, one must represent the people's struggle with dignity. Right. Must represent with dignity. <laughs> Alabama law allowed for the creations of third parties quickly because they were sure, sure it would never be done. That's the enemy's error. Because of the illiteracy among whites, because of the rate of illiteracy among whites, the Alabama law prescribed that each party must have an emblem. Thus, we in Alabama, Lowndes County, had the task of getting an emblem. I have always known from the time I'm a young man working in the movement, anytime you have a problem, take it to the people, they'll solve it. All right. We called a meeting of the people, we said, listen, this is the emblem of the Alabama Democratic State Party. Obviously, we gotta have our people voting for a white cock that says white supremacy. <laughs> we have to have an emblem. Please come up with one. And there were some examples but somebody came up with a black panther. <laughs> the people! <laughs> you must never lose faith in your people, especially the illiterate masses. They are the true salt of our movement. <laughs> they came up with a black panther. Who, putting a black panther next to a white cock, would not immediately say, black panther. <laughs> Yes, our Black Panther will get rid of a white cop just with blowing his breath. Oh, get out the way. <laughs> <laughs> this is the beginning of the Black Panther Party. The Africans in Alabama understood that they could not vote in the Democratic Party. But this decision not to vote there preceded another one. Let me take you back into your history. In 1964, Africans could not vote in Mississippi. The talk now of the trial of Medgar Evans just gives you some example. As a matter of fact, for us living there, it was nothing but terror. I mean, we were in Vietnam. I remember a man once said to me, are well, you only 19 years old and you out there getting shot at? How you do that? I said, well, if I wasn't conscious, I'd be in Vietnam getting shot for nothing. <laughs> Take a bullet for my people any day. <laughs> Take a bullet for nothing, never. <laughs> Never! <laughs> right. Yes. Right. There are people were here. They had to go to a party. We developed in the 1964 campaign, Africans couldn't vote. Listen to the strategy of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. We decided, of course, I voted against the proposal. I lost. But me, I'm disciplined. I am disciplined. Once I adhere to the principles of an organization, if a vote goes down and I lose, but I agree with the principles, I stay in the organization. As a matter of fact, if I don't agree with the principles, I would never be in the organization in the first place. Consequently, in all the organizations I've been in, in many cases I've been to minority, lost positions. Later those positions proved to be the correct. Sometimes they proved to be incorrect. But I'm a disciplined member in any organization, always willing to have the minority submit to the will of majority once the principles of the organization is kept intact. Thus I lost this one, and many of us who were nationalists, we lost it. But we're honest fighters. The program of SNCC was simple. We are going to create a mock Democratic Party. Their name? Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Of course, we were opposed to the word democratic, but we lost again. They voted for the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. I say that I'm a disciplined organizer, and I'm a disciplined member of an organization. When I vote in a vote, and I lose, I do not suck teeth. I come to those who win. Give me a program. I'm going to work best on it to show you where you're incorrect. Consequently, I now come to take on the program of the majority and work hard in their program, not trying to sabotage it at all, because I'm convinced it's incorrect. As we work harder, they will see their incorrectness, or I might see my incorrectness. But one thing is clear, it is only by working on the program of the majority in the organization, even if you disagree with it, that truth will be found out. We were against it, but we worked very hard. I had the honor of serving as director of the Congressional District for the Delta of Mississippi, where most of the violence was to be found. This was an honor for me. Our Congressional District had none other than Miss Fannie Lou Hamer as our Congressional District. One of the rewards of longevity 
is that one of the best things in my job is that I always have the honor of meeting people who fight for their people without expecting the slightest rewards. It is they who let me know that the people can never be corrupted, only the petty bourgeois elements of our people. Here they are. Miss Hamer, I need not speak of. All of you know. If you don't know, you need to know. You need to know. Our congressional district was very well organized. We went to protest in Atlantic City. I was against the protest, but I went, followed out and carried out my task to the point, efficiently, effectively, so that no one can criticize me or even suggest that I'm trying to sabotage the program because I do not agree with it. The Democratic Party told the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party that they will give them two seats out of the delegation. When one would add the bloodshed that was spilled in Mississippi, the torture, the imprisonment, all of the problems, the people getting kicked off their lands, the unemployment, etc. Really, this was nothing but an insult. Some African leaders tried to convince the people of Mississippi that they should accept the compromise. But the people of Mississippi, they had a different experience. They could not accept the compromise because they would have to return to Mississippi and tell the people who shed their blood whom they represented why they accepted such an insult. They could not accept it. Thus, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party returned to Mississippi empty-handed. Those of us who were in a minority position when the vote went down 18 months earlier were ecstatic. Our point had arrived. We came forward now. You ain't got no program. Your only program is follow the Democratic Party. We got one. What's your program? Forget the Democratic Party. Make your own independent party. <laughs> they laughed at us. Oh, third parties never work in America. <laughs> There's nothing. That's what the white man tell you. <laughs> Even if history doesn't work yesterday, doesn't mean that everything stays the same. Everything changes all the time. And what didn't work yesterday can easily work today if you're making concrete analysis of the changing materiality and especially the rising consciousness of the masses of your people. Right. So when we went to Alabama, we went for independent politics. Our party, the All African People's Revolutionary Party, has never participated in any activity by the Democratic Party. Never. Right. And we never will. Right. For us, it's a very simple question. In the first instance, the Democratic Party can never represent our interests. Right. Never. Right. It's the, and only in America can you see this, where the richest people in the country and the poorest people in the country belong to the same party. Only in America, Kennedy belongs to the Democratic Party, the poorest sharecrop in Mississippi belongs to the Democratic Party. One doesn't have to know anything about politics to know that wherever the rich and the poor are assembled together, the rich is always eating off of the poor. All right. <laughs> one doesn't have to be political, one does not have to be conscious to know that at all. Therefore, in the Democratic Party, where there's rich and poor, there's no question for us who controls. It's the rich. Right. And if you're poor, they'll make you rich. I give you a clear example. When Jesse Jackson started to run for president of the United States of America... No, 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 me, I don't attack. When Je I just give facts. When Jesse... Facts. When Jesse Jackson started to run for president of the United States of America, he was not very rich. Today, he's more than a millionaire. And let me tell you something. He did not steal this money. He got it legally. The democratic system is such that it legally corrupts you. I'll give you examples everywhere. I remember when Reagan was president of this country. Every time he spoke about Japan, I thought he was going to go to war with them. I thought someday he going to slip and even call them Japs. When Reagan escaped down after eight years, after two months, he went to Japan. He made a speech for 20 minutes and got two million dollars, all of it legal. Consequently, the very system has corruption built into it. And if you're poor, they make you rich. And once you become rich, no matter what you say, you forget the poor. I know many comrades who fought with me in SNCC. I see them all the time. They say, oh, you know, uh, I've got to go out here. When they left SNCC, they say, listen, you know, the thing is rough. I want to go out here and make a little bit of money, but we need money. As soon as I get some money, I'll help support the <laughs> revolution. All of them become rich. And every time you see them, they're the first to cry poor mouth. I ain't got no money. Life is so hard. I can't do nothing. So I even ask them for money. They're not going to give it. Once you become rich, you forget the poor. Because the reason you want to get rich is to get away from the poor. That's right. That's right. That's 
the only reason you want to get rich. <laughs> and they will tell you now from the Bible, blessed are the poor. <laughs> you must believe what you say. I know it's true. The other day when having a discussion with my mother in Africa, where she was staying for some time, she said, how much money do you have in your pocket? That's going to be travel. I don't have very much. She said, what are you going to do? I said, I can travel around the world with $10 and I will eat into every country I go. I will do it. I've done it before. I have done it before. When I worked in Mississippi, I had no money. As a SNCC field secretary, we were paid $10 a week if you got it, and most of the time she didn't. Right. Who fed me? The people for whom I work. I know the people. You work for them. They will protect you with their lives. Right. I know the people. I know the people. <laughs> Our party started a campaign in 1972. What was the campaign? Smash the Democratic, Republican, and all capitalist parties. We invited many people to join us. No one joined us. They're all crazy. You know, the Democratic Party is just getting us into positions. We're just getting here. We're just getting there. We understood from the very jump that those positions which they made were to fool the people. But we know you can't fool the people. You can only fool the petty bourgeois elements. It is they who ran to be mayors. The capitalist system thought they had us. <laughs> With African mayors in the cities, we got them. But Los Angeles showed them, you put anybody there, you won't fool the people. They wrecked Los Angeles even with an African mayor named Tom Bradley who came up through the ranks of the police. That's right. All right. You can't fool the people, only the petty bourgeois elements. Since you cannot fool the people, it behooves us to depend upon no one except the people to advance us. Right. And it's only the people that advances us. Right. We say it all the time. Every individual advancement made by every African in this country is a result of the blood of the masses of the people. Everyone. We repeat the statement all the time, it's true. There's nothing that we have achieved in this country without shedding blood. Absolutely nothing. To sit in a filthy five and ten cent store in Selma, Alabama, you got to shed your blood. To ride on a bus where you want to ride, even though you pay the same money as everybody else in Montgomery, Alabama, you got to shed your blood. To live in a neighborhood where you want to live in New York City, even if you've got the same amount of money, you've got to shed your blood. To get the vote just like any foreigner gets when they get here, you've got to shed your blood. To get your children into city college, into schools where you pay taxes, you've got to shed your blood. No African sitting here, no non-African sitting here can show me one advancement that an individual African made that was not the result of the blood of the masses of the people. <laughs> History is clear. Logic is strong here. It shows us clearly every position occupied by every individual African was paid for by the blood of the people. That position belongs to the people. Right. It simply means that if I were to be mayor, something I would never do under these conditions, but making a great hypothesis, if I were to be mayor, the only reason I would be mayor would be to mobilize my people, to continue to organize my people so they can continue to wage struggle against the system. I told Marion Barry, who was my first boss, he was the first chairperson of SNCC, a rough brother he was, I know him. They'd knock him down off the seat, he'd get back up. When we got tired, he'd come and he said, you're my forces. Said, yeah, you're forces. We tired of these folks. We don't want to do that no more. Well, y'all can be tired. If I'm the only one, I'm going out by myself. He'd walk out the door. We have to follow him. I know Marion Barry. But I told him when he became mayor, I said, Marion, if I became mayor of this town, he said, you know, maybe you ought to think about it. I said, no, brother. I said, if I became mayor, the only reason I'd be mayor to call the White House and tell him, I want this. If I don't get this, I'm putting 10,000 students in the street non-violently. I'm blocking Washington, D.C. Ain't nothing moving in your capital. Right. What makes you think a mayor can't call a protest? That's right. <laughs> Why? <coughs> what makes you think a mayor cannot use the position of mayor brought forth by the blood of the people to advance the people's cause? That's what it should be used for. If it's not used for that, you betray the blood of the people. <laughs> our party is faithful to our line against bourgeois parties and smashing them all. We are happy to see that some Africans, after being insulted by the Democratic Party, now come to understand the truth of that which we speak. 
we Africans must have our own independent political party. As a matter of fact, once we do this, the Republican and Democratic Party will fall and the country will splinter into parties. These are simple facts. You can look at it yourself, just quantitatively speaking. Many people think that John F. Kennedy became president with a great majority. You must look at history. Don't listen to this capitalist press. Kennedy won by a very slim margin. You know who gave him that margin? Us. The history is there. Martin Luther King was in jail when the, the vote was going on between Kennedy and Nixon. No African was concerned with that. Everyone was concerned about Martin Luther King. We're not thinking about voting. We're thinking about King. Everybody loved King because King is an honest man. If you disagree with his tactic, if you disagree with his strategy, you must respect the man whose actions conform to his words. And whether you like him or not, he said nonviolence. He was in the front lines, Jack. He said nonviolence. He was the first to go to jail. He said nonviolence. He was the first to be whooped. Therefore, you have to respect this man even if you don't like him. I know many said, well, I ain't going for that nonviolent stuff. I ain't into that. What you doing? Nothing. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. That's right. You don't criticize somebody who's doing something when you're doing nothing. <laughs> My Luther King was clear. I said we may disagree with him, but we certainly had to support him. He was clear in his direction. He was clear in what he said. My only disagreement with King was a simple one. I never saw nonviolence as a principle, only as a tactic. This was my only disagreement with King. This was my only disagreement with King. This broke down on the practical level. If nonviolence was ineffective, King would continue. I would pick up a gun. That's the only difference. The only difference. The only difference. We said this aspect of having an independent party is necessary and crucial. Right. And it comes from the level of conception. Right. We will, once we develop an independent party, we will be the swing vote. Look at the Kennedy vote. We said Martin Luther King was in jail. Everybody was concerned about King. King was killed in incommunicado in a jail in Alabama. Kennedy was a senator. As a senator, he had the power to enter any jail in America. He called one of his aides. He said, go quickly to this jail in Alabama, talk to King. The aide went into the jail, spoke to King. He called Kennedy, said, King is all right, they're afraid to touch him. Kennedy called a press conference. I'll never forget it. He called Madam Coretta King on the telephone. And Reverend King Sr., he said to them, I know you're worried about Dr. King. I have sent an aide into the jail. There's nothing wrong with Dr. King, he's well. And I assure you that he will not be touched. The next day, two days before the vote, Coretta Scott King and Dr. King called an election, uh, a press conference. They said before everybody, said he's a good man. He cares about King. He sent somebody to see about King. When he said that, everybody voted for Kennedy. Kennedy won by less than 2% of the vote. That's a historical fact. You know who he lost out against? Nixon. That's why he never forgave us. These are facts. When they talk about Kennedy, you think he won with such a great margin. He won by us. What did he do for us? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I give you just Kennedy, you can go down to all the others, all of them. What do they give us? Nothing. Why do they give us nothing? Because we play politics like we play. Politics is based on power. Even bourgeois electoral politics is based on power. Power for a people comes only through the organized masses. As we are not organized, we have no power at all. And the Democratic Party knows this. It is only in an independent party that we'll be able to collect our own power, feel our own power, feel our own power, and from a position of strength, deal with the others. It's just a simple question. Look, Jack, we have 40% of the vote. We want 40% of the power. We want this, we want this, we want this, we want this, we want this. Everybody does it. When the Polish go to give their vote to the Democratic Party, they already got what they bargained for. We're the only ones who have faith. <laughs> faith in an enemy who has never given us any reason to have faith in him. 
just blinded faith. Well, you know, they're going to do what they say. And what do we come up with? Nothing. All right. We will not belabor the point. Just let you know that if you really want to feel the strength of the power of your people, you must build an independent political party. Our party's clear on this. We bring you a slight update on our Smash the FBI and the CIA program. This program we instituted in 1972. It is 1994, and we're still at it, and no organization wants to join it. <laughs> but we have a responsibility to our people. We know the FBI and the CIA are the pigs that brag confusion inside our community. But we know them. Our people know them. I work with all sorts of organizations, all sorts of statistics and research from our party against the FBI and CIA. Let me give you an example. When the Soviet Union was betrayed by this scum, Gorbachev, and that's all he is and that's all it was, betrayal, Bush made the great announcement. <laughs> The evil umpire has fallen. We have a lot of uh, CIA agents who've been there. Now we're going to take them and put them in the ghettos. He said it. We have the article. And he even said most of them will be sent to the ghetto in Los Angeles. All right. If you look at Los Angeles, these pigs created some havoc there. Pumping drugs and guns into the hands and developing gangs like the Crips and the Bloods. But when the rebellion came, it was the same Crips and the same Bloods who received guns from the police to shoot their people who shot the police. <laughs> the same ones. The CIA, I laugh at them. I remember when the news was made, I was talking to a sister. She said, oh, we're in real trouble now. I said, what do you mean? She said, do you hear what they said? They send the CIA everywhere. They're coming for you. I said, well, I ain't worried about them. <laughs> I ain't even thinking about them. I said, they had all the sophisticated machines they had in Vietnam. And when the Vietnamese overran them, they were running for the helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> they were looking at the machine, and the Vietnamese were banging in the door. <laughs> what happened in the Vietnamese? Oh, we got to get out of here. We're running for helicopters, kicking each other off. Yes, these are facts. When you face an enemy, you must demystify the enemy. The enemy is a man just like you. The enemy is a woman just like you and makes errors just like you. And when they make errors, you must take all advantage of them. Demystify them. Because of my work, I know the FBI. My mother can bear testimony. You know what these pigs used to do? They used to call my mother up when I was in the South late at night, making believe they were the Ku Klux Klan, which they are, and saying, oh, we're going to kill your son now. Imagine that. These pigs, I have dealt with them since I've been a kid. Now I'm a man. That's right. A real man. And when I was a kid, I thought I could whip them. Now I'm a man. I know exactly how people go whip them. The FBI and the CIA must be smashed if you want revolution. In any state, it is the police force that keeps the status quo in check. Undermining this, the police force of any state makes the alternative easier for revolution. Thus, attacking the FBI and the CIA is a proper revolutionary strategy. And even though we started by ourselves, since then, we want to tell you great advances have been made, even though we've been alone today. The people have the more disrespect for the FBI and the CIA than ever before. Always. And it will become worse and worse because of a simple truth. When they were up there like kings, they did whatever they wanted to do. Nobody looked at them, so they didn't cover their dirt. They don't even know how to cover their dirt. And now the people looking at them, looking at the back and looking at them now, they're going to fumble and bumble and just trip up over themselves. Because they've never had anyone looking at them. They were above everybody else, but now today the people are looking at them, looking at their tricks. They can't hardly move, and we're going to tie them up some more until we tie them up completely and make them a force of neutrality in the struggle to overthrow capitalism. We want to give you an update on the African United Front. This will take some time. It's your history. I had the great privilege of going to Vietnam when I was a young man. Of course, I didn't go to fight for America. I didn't go to South Vietnam. I went to North Vietnam. And one of the greatest honors I have to this day is that I had lunch with the great Ho Chi Minh when America was bombing Hanoi.
was just give you a little story which I've not made public there, which made me assure that America could never whoop these people. All right. The Vietnamese, I want to tell you, are some beautiful people. You must understand any people who can organize themselves with such determination to go up against America, confident that they can destroy it, have to be some beautiful people. <laughs> we said, power begins on the level of conception. The Vietnamese conceived that they can defeat America, and they defeated America. Power begins on the level of conception. When I was there, I asked the Vietnamese to give me work on United Front. Of course, before I went there, I had read just about everything I could read on the Vietnamese Revolution. Right. And one of the things that caught my attention and attracted my attention was the Vietnamese were able to form a United Front of all sectors and all factions to form a United Front against the Japanese, against the French, and against the Americans. I recognized that this is what was lacking in our people. In my early days in Stick in Mississippi, Stick was able to force an organization called COFO, Confederation, Confederation of Federated Organizations. We had in it SNCC, the NAACP, the Urban League, CORE, and SCLC. While we were in Mississippi, S NAACP did not do very much work. They had some very strong organizers, such as Brother Edgar Mevers, but they themselves didn't have a lot of people there. Neither did the Urban League. SCLC did not have too many people. The ground was occupied mainly by SNCC, and some core field secretaries in the southern part of the state. But we decided this COFO, Confederation, Con Council of Federated Organization, was necessary to present a united front against the forces of racism in Mississippi. Right. Thus, this aspect of a united front has plagued me from my youth. It's a necessity. The Vietnamese, I said, are very beautiful people. They brought out all the documents I wanted. We were sitting upstairs in a little room. A comrade there who spoke English had the report. He was reading, and comrade, after we collected the students, now we were moving to the intelligentsia. And just as he said that, the siren went off. You know, so he looked at me and said, Comrade, the Americans are coming to bomb. We must go to the shelter. Let's go. You know, the Vietnamese are very small people in stature. I look like a gigantic African going with them to the shelter. And they have these very small shelters. You know, they just walk in on, I have to crawl in on my stomach. But the comrade comes, I pay no attention to them, I go in the shelter, it's a small shelter, we sit down, he looks, he said, comrade, are you okay? I said, I'm fine, you know, I'm all cool, let's get it on. So uh, he said, everybody's fine? We said, fine. I didn't even know he had the paper with him. He pulled the paper out. He said, and comrade, the problem with the intelligence is we're such. <laughs> He's reading the program. The fly planes are coming, you hear them, they bomb. So they drop a bomb maybe about a block from where we are. The dust from the shelter falls on the paper. And comrade, after that... <laughs> so what? It blew my mind. I said, America gonna mess with these people? Oof. Oof. The Vietnamese gave me all of the instructions and information that I required on the building of a united front. When I came back to the United States, there was only one burning issue on my mind. Create a united front. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee assigned me to Washington, D.C. You know, I went to school in Washington, D.C. at Howard University. I broke my tooth on struggle in Washington, D.C. I know the city. My job was to organize an African United Front. Thanks to the work that the Vietnamese had shared with me, thanks to the understanding, we were able to create inside of Washington, D.C., before the enemy knew what was happening, an African United Front that brought every organization in D.C. into it. Marion Barry was part of it. Fauntroy was part of it. There is no African in Washington, D.C. today who is anybody that was not part of that United Front. And we had it so well organized and so properly structured that when the police killed a young man, it was Fauntroy who read our step our press statement which said this young man committed justifiable homicide. A united front then was clear to me. Of course when I left for Africa they divided the united front. You know how they did it very easily. <laughs> Brother wrote me and said after you left a white man came and said oh when you all started this front I didn't understand it. I thought it was anti-white. Now I see something good I want to help you all. So we want to give you all some money. That was it. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> It was finished. That's why we always insisted that an African United Front must be financed only by Africans. In 1969, 
The All African People's Revolutionary Party gave me the task of organizing an African United Front in the United States of America with the leadership here since 1969. Without stop to 1994, this has been a task which I have taken seriously. And every time, as Africa is our weakness, that we have come close to having a united front, outside forces always step in to create divisions, and these outside forces are always Zionist forces. Always. Always. Your chairperson is here. Ask him. As late as November of this year, on behalf of my party, the All-African People's Revolutionary Party, carrying out my task for United Front, I sent letters to Reverend Ben, to Dr. Ben Chavis. I sent letters to Jesse Jackson. The same letter I sent to Jesse Jackson, I sent to Minister Louis Farrakhan. I also sent letters to Johnny Jacobs of the Urban League, and I sent letters to Kwesi of the uh, Caucus. Your chairperson has copies of all of these letters, because when we met with him in February last year, he will tell you, we discussed only one issue. Brother, we want a united front. Brother, we don't care what we got to do, we want this united front. Your chairperson, on your behalf, promised us that he would have it to us soon. <laughs> we thanked him. <laughs> but we've had experience with this. Uh, at least he was happy to report today that, brother, I know it took some time, but last Wednesday we got going. <laughs> this race is not a race for the swift. It is for he who endure it to the end. Your chairperson will share with you the information we sent him. Attached to the two letters were two documents. One that went back to 1972, when we had gathered together all the leadership. Roy Wilkins was alive at that time. Vernon Jordan was alive at that time. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad was alive at that time. Minister Louis Farrakhan would serve as his representative. We had Jesse Jackson. We had everybody. And three days before the meeting came, Zionism launched an attack and destroyed the entire meeting. He has the document. We also sent him another document, one written in 1982, a letter signed by Johnny Jacobs and Minister Louis Farrakhan. I took Minister Louis Farrakhan to Johnny Jacobs' office in New York here. It was the first time they met each other, introduced after much discussion with Johnny Jacobs. I would go there by myself, sit, talk with him, I would call him up, speak with him. I'd call up Farrakhan, I'd call him all up, speak with him, because all I want is a symbol of unity among our people. If we can get nothing else except that, give the people a symbol of unity. I went to Africa, I want to tell you, I was overjoyed. Do you know that I had in my hand a letter calling for a united front signed by Johnny Jacobs and Minister Louis Farrakhan? Your chairperson has the facts in his hand. He has the documents. I was ecstatic. Before I could even touch down in Africa, Jesse Jackson announced that he was going to run for President of the United States. Of course, this news did not make us happy, but we saw a good point. This would be better, now we can use all the forces to get the United Front. Of course, we know the enemy never sleeps. In the South, an old woman once said to me when I first said, she said, son, son, you look mad. I said, yes, ma'am, I'm mad. She said, son, you look like you want to kill him. I said, ma'am, I want to kill him. She said, you really want to get him, son? I said, ma'am, I want to get him. She said, son, if you want to get these white folk, you got to stay up all night and get up early in the morning, because they don't sleep. <laughs> they don't sleep. Many, and I will spend many more. Many more. Jesse Jackson announced this. I wrote to Minister Farrakhan quickly. He came to su suggest certain ideas. But Minister Farrakhan, I've known for over three decades. I know the minister well. I know his thinking. I know his movements. That's my job. The minister had already made up his mind. But you know, Minister Farrakhan is a very polite man when he comes to deal with you in his diplomatic efforts. Ah, oh, Brother Kwame. Yes, beloved minister. I said, oh, I have a little problem. And you know, I think that you are the most politically astute person among... <laughs> you know he plays the violin. <laughs> you know he plays the violin. <laughs> oh, he just, he, just, he just built me up there. I said, where are you coming from? He said, uh, 
Brother Jesse Jackson has a serious problem. I said, yes, because I tell you the truth. When Jesse announced that he was going to run, I just said, they're going to pop him. <laughs> I said, well, if that's what he want to go for, that's him. Everybody decided what they want to go for. So I just figured they would get rid of him. It was only later, upon more profound analysis, that I see I made a mistake. I came to see quickly, oh, no, the FBI and the CIA have to protect Jesse. Because if Jesse Jackson gets wasted for this vote thing, which King was pushing us to, no African going to vote in this country, it's over. I understood instinctively, quickly, I made a mistake, I made a mistake. They're not going to kill him. Now, Minister Farrakhan came to see me, he said, uh, he said, Jesse Jackson has a lot of problems. I said, yeah, it looks like he in it. He said, you know, somebody might kill him. <laughs> I said, they certainly will. He said, well, you don't seem to be in no problem about it. I said, well, that's his choice, you know. They might kill you. <laughs> they might kill me. You've decided they're going to kill you for the nation of Islam. I decided they're going to kill me for African Revolution. I don't see no problem with it. He decided they're going to kill him for president. That's his choice. That's his choice. That's his choice. In revolution, there is no sentiment at all. Any man, any way in life, you make sentiment, you make mistake. I'm divorced twice, all of them because I made mistakes around sentiments. <laughs> so you can't do that. You have to be clear. <laughs> clear. Well, then, listen, that I don't make, I can't make mistakes out there on sentiments. Maybe in the house I can do them out there. <laughs> yes. Mr. Farrakhan said, well, well, we think he's in trouble and I want to help him. I said, well, that's your choice. He said, uh, I'm going to send the Nation of Islam, the FOI, to protect him. What do you think about that? I said, that's your decision. Well, obviously, when I said that, he knew what I meant. He said, well, you don't seem like, uh, like I said, well, that's your decision, Minister. That's what you wanted to do it. He said, well, what about you? If you were being attacked, don't you want, would you want the FOI to, 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 to protect you? I reminded the Minister, Minister Louis Farrakhan, when I was nominated Chairperson of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the first public meeting I had with any leader was with the Honorable Elijah Mohammed. I was 26 years old. I can never forget that meeting. Throughout that entire meeting, I was just a young man. First of all, everybody's mind was blown because the first person we met was the Honorable Elijah Mohammed. We went there for two reasons. Threaten nationalism, threaten the position against the war in Vietnam because the Nation of Islam had taken those positions long before others. The Honorable Elijah Mohammed went to jail in World War II, went to jail. Others went to jail, too. Bayard Rustin went to jail as a pacifist. But when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad came, he told him, I ain't fighting the devil's army. <laughs> That's all he said. <laughs> he ain't said nothing else. I ain't fighting in the devil's army. So I know that if the Honorable Elijah Muhammad went to jail for not fighting the devil's army, none of his followers was going to, going to fight in the devil's army. I knew that. So that was our only position. We had a very beautiful meeting. Uh, Muhammad Ali was there that meeting. I mean, I'll never forget that day. I spent the entire day in the house of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. At the end of the day, when we were leaving, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad sat down at the table. He said, son, young man, he said, the devil wants you. I said, yes, yeah, sir. He said, son, the devil want to kill you. I said, yes, sir. He said, son, the devil going to try and kill you. I said, yes, sir. He said, son, I'm worried about you. I said, oh, thank you, sir. But, uh, where can we? Said, son, I'm going to give an order for the FOI to protect you anywhere you go. I said, thank you, sir. And I felt very humble. Said, thank you, sir. You know, but that's very kind of you, sir. But you know, sir, I move a lot. You have a lot to do. The FOI is busy. They have so much to do. And I went through all this whole spiel, you know. When I was finished, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad looked at me and said, son, I wasn't asking you. <laughs> Anyone can tell you. Anywhere I go, any FOI person is there. He must protect me. I reminded Minister Louis Farrakhan of that. Matter of fact, I just told him, I got one up on Jesse. <laughs> the Honorable Elijah Muhammad gave the order for me. You give me for Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, well, he said, well, well, you know, Jesse's in trouble. Uh, don't you think if you were in trouble, I said, listen. I just told you the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has given that to me. And I will promise you this. The FOI can protect me for everything. But one thing they will never have to protect me for is trying to be President of the United States of America. <laughs> but you know, Minister Farrakhan is a minister, has some sentimentality, etc., etc. So he made the decision to send the FOI. I told him as we were leaving. I said, the decision you made is one for which I must congratulate you. Certainly, it is one made in the best of brotherly spirit. I said, my only problem is that when the Zionists pull the bullet, whether you and Jesse will be on the same side of the barracks or not. The only words I said to him, we left. 
I didn't even have to wait before you know what happened. Got a religion, this religion, that religion, and before it's over, not over did Jesse attack him, but even Johnny Jacobs wrote letters attacking the minister Farrakhan. You could imagine how disgusted I was once again. After all these years of work, going to meet with Jacobs, Meeting with Farrakhan, holding hands with Jesse, getting all of them, bringing them together, have my program ready to bring a united front. These Zionist pigs came once again and destroyed it. This letter, which I wrote, and your chairperson has documented proof, in the very letter to all of them, I said, I've been working with this program for the All African People's Revolutionary Party since 1969. Before then, I worked on it for SNCC. I have many, 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 many years of experience in this work. Every time that we bring our people together, it is always destroyed by Zionist forces. I wrote the letter in November. When I got into the country last week, guess what I heard on the radio? Guess what I heard? The All African People's Revolutionary Party has attacked Zionism from its very inception. This itself follows for me, myself, politically from my work. As you know, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee condemned them since 1967 in the war against Egypt, saying very simply, Egypt is Africa, you touch one square inch of Africa, we don't care who you are, we are against you, we are against Zionism. Simple as that. It was as simple as that. You notice that we say Zionism. We are very clear here. We tell the entire world we are anti-Zionist. We cannot be anti-Judaic, not us. We know Africa gave Judaism to the world. We know that. If you do not know it, go and read a book by Sigmund Freud. That's who I'm sending you to. Not to Dr. Ben. I'm sending you to Sigmund Freud. Moses and Monotheism, his last book. You'll read it. But you don't even have to read it. All you have to know is Africa was the first to give monotheism, belief in one God, to the world. Thus, any religion, being the first religion, chronologically speaking, to preach monotheism, can only come out of Africa. In Palestine, at that time, they were worshipping idols, and would do so until the Prophet, peace be upon his name, came to liberate them and give them monotheism in the form of Islam. Consequently, Palestine could not produce Judaism at that time. Only Africa could. These are scientific facts, based clearly in history. We said, we're never anti-Jewish. You cannot be. I'm a conscious African. Matter of fact, when they get mad with you, I tell them, hey, you better respect me, Jack. I give you your religion. <laughs> yes. Yes. I tell them the truth with all arrogance. <laughs> you better respect me, Jack. I gave you your religion. Without me, you'd still be wandering in the wilderness. <laughs> they will say that we're anti-Semitic. This is stupidity. The word Semite is a scientific word which precisely gives biological specification to a group of people. Yasser Arafat is a Semite. The All African People's Revolutionary Party gives unconditional support to the Palestine Liberation Organization. We support the Palestinians. How can we be anti-Semitic? Shamir is not a, Pal is not a, a Semite. He's a Kasukoid. Yeah. So they shouldn't say we're anti-Semitic, they should say we're anti cosacoid At least they should be logical. <laughs> we are anti-Zionist. When you hear them insulting Farrakhan, do not think they're insulting Farrakhan. You must know your people's culture. Your people are a very religious people, more religious than most. Anyway, in America, Africans are the most religious people in America. There's no question here. This is the culture of the Africans. They're very religious. No African group of people will sit and listen to anyone insult any religion without walking out on them. Thus, when they condemn uh, Farrakhan, saying that he comes before the people and screams anti-Jewish epithets and the people go wild, they're not condemning Farrakhan. They're showing the contempt they have for us and our culture. They know absolutely nothing about it. No person will have a hearing from these people who come to condemn any religion. These people love religion. It's in their blood. Look at Africa's contributions to religion. It gave Judaism to the world. It stabilized Christianity for the world. It saved Islam for the world. How could an African not through his culture understand to have respect for religions? They come everywhere. The trouble with Zionism is that it has nothing to do with religion. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. 
The founder of Zionism was a man called Theodor Herzl, H-E-R-Z-L. In his diaries, he says, I'm an atheist. An atheist isn't someone who doesn't believe in God. An atheist is someone who denies the existence of God. Now, right. right. dig this. There's a man who tells me there ain't no God, and he's going to come and lead the people back to the land which God promised them. <laughs> if you don't know, you become confused, you know. You really become confused. I'm not telling you take it from me. Theodore Herschel has books. The Jewish state, his diaries. Read them. Because these movements affect your people. They destroy unity every time you try to come together. If you understand Jewish theology, and everyone must, it simply says that God chose the Jews for whatever reason. Of course, you must understand this God should have chosen. God doesn't choose anybody. You choose God. You choose God. Even those who say they're Christians, God didn't choose them. It's only when they truly follow God's path are they God's chosen. Right. They say that God chose them and God promised to give them the land. We have no disagreement with that. But let me tell you something. My mother used to tell me from the time I'm small, God is no respecter of persons. Now my mama told me that. So if God promised you something, you better wait until, until God decide to give it to you. In the South, the old folk used to say, God don't come when you call him. He come when you need him. So don't you worry. He come. Now, if God promised them the land, how are they going to come and play God and decide to take the land with American guns by shooting the Palestinians? This is nothing but the devil in disguise. Zionists understand that the biggest threat they have in this country comes from the African masses. All right. All right. They understand this. That's why every time we get to get together, they come. And look at the contempt they have for us. Do you hear them calling up somebody and saying, Clinton said such and such, tell him, I'll blast him? Do they ever call up the mafia and say the mafia, so and so made an anti-Jewish statement, condemn him? Do they call up anybody else? All over the country they make anti-Jewish statements everywhere. This country is anti-Jewish to its core. They never call up anybody. But every time they want to cause some trouble with us, you know, so-and-so said such and such. You need to condemn him just when we're about to unite. And what happens? They come out and they condemn. That's right. The Anti-Defamation League, it has been proven has been spying on all African organizations in this country, starting with Martin Luther King, Jr. All right. All right. The hero of Jesse Jackson, the hero of Jesse Jackson, we haven't heard Jesse condemn the Anti-Defamation League for spying on Martin Luther King. No one has called on him to do that. It's time that we call on Jesse to condemn the Anti-Defamation League for spying on the African community. All we're asking for is equal time. We ain't asking for nothing else. The Anti-Defamation League ain't nothing but a bunch of spiers and liars. That's all they've ever been. They spy on lying everybody, and they've been caught red-handed spying. You must read these things because they affect your people. They have come now to wipe out completely all the files that they have, and they were spying on none other than Martin Luther King, Jr. That's right. Jesse has a responsibility here, if he's objective, to condemn them. That's right. The Zionist movement has contempt for us. That's why they interfere into the internal affairs of our movement anytime, every time, without the slightest question. I remember when Mandela was getting ready to come to the United States of America. These Zionists sent a group to meet him in Switzerland, in Geneva, to sit down and tell him what he should say and what he should not say about Zionism. Is this not nothing but contempt? Could they go to any other leader? Can they go to the head of the mafia? Can they go to the, tell them they cannot do that? Why do they do it to us? Because they have nothing but contempt for us. Zionism is racism to the core. To the core.
we are going to build an African united front in this country. Our efforts started since 1967. What it took us two weeks to do in 1967, in 1994, we do in two hours. We're going to have an African united front in this country. The pressure of the masses of our people are going to insist and are going to make the leaders sit down, even if for symbolic unity, but they will force them to do it. And you old activists, you old strugglers have a job to do that you must at least try and get your people a vision of unity before they die. You must demand that these leaders sit down with each other irrespective of their ideological persuasion. A united front, an African united front is what we will have. Anyway, for us of the All-African People's Revolutionary Party, we are not tired. We will never get tired. Anytime we think about getting tired, we think about our grandparents who worked from Kansi to Kansi and kept on going, and we get all the energy we need. Oh, We want to conclude with two points. One is the point of violence. All right. All right. You must understand this point very carefully. Right. Violence has two points, reactionary violence and revolutionary violence. Everyone knows that the Africans in this country are oppressed through violence. When the police shoot down a brother, when the police shoots a 68-year-old woman, when the police shoots a seven-year-old boy anywhere in this country, it is for one reason alone, to intimidate the population to keep them in line. This is violence. America's a racist, capitalist country. Everybody knows that. I cannot, as an African, in good conscience, advocate to my people that any one of them put down any gun in a racist, capitalist state. When I served as Honorary Prime Minister of the Black Panther Party, and uh, Brother David Brothers, whom I just introduced to you as a Central Committee member of the All-African People's Revolutionary Party, was the chairperson of the New York chapter of the Black Panther Party for years. Uh, yeah, yeah, Rob. <laughs> yeah. Don't let the press fool you. They ain't seen the real revolutionaries yet. <laughs> That brother ain't number 75 years young, but he got more experience, you understand, than a whole lot of people who've been dead for centuries. He was chairperson of the Black Panther Party in New York, he will tell you. We had more guns in the Black Panther Party chapter in New York alone than all the gangs in New York have today. I'm speaking to you facts. And yet, nobody was getting shot in the African community by these guns. It is not guns that kill people, it is people that kill people. And they don't kill you with guns, they can kill you with poison. The problem is not guns, the problem is capitalism. The problem is a value which says that you can get rich by any means necessary. And the ones who are up there, they can steal with impunity. The little brother in the street can't steal with impunity, imbued with capitalist philosophy. He does just what they did, but in the raw manner, he picks up the gun and tries to rip off whoever he sees. This is incorrect. But you must not let this incorrect behavior blind you to the responsibility of the struggles of the masses of your people. Our youth must be educated. Only we will do that. We will come to it in final conclusion. We say these guns which these youth have must be used to protect the community. But let me show you exactly how the guns came. Most of you here are old enough to go back to the 50s with me. You remember the 50s? 
If you stepped on a brother's shoe, his alligator shoe, he cut you from ear to ear. That's a fact. The enemy was sure that in the 1950s he had us. I mean, if you saw us in the 1950s, when Brother Malcolm was speaking out there, when Brother Michaud was speaking on the corner, you'd laugh. Africans would come by and laugh at them. Oh, they're talking nonsense. Nobody paid attention. That's right. The enemy was sure he had them. They ain't going nowhere. But it is this same generation of the 50s that jumped up on him on the 60s. The Chinese say, if you make a mistake and you know it's a mistake and you don't correct the mistake, you've made your second mistake. The enemy is not like us. They are scientific. When they make a mistake, they correct it. We are the only ones who make mistakes and continue making them. <laughs> Anyways, we revolutionaries, since mistakes are fatal, we are forced to correct them. We seek, we seek quickly to detect them. So they can be fatal in our job. They are. The Benami was surprised. You mean that these Africans who were sleeping and dope head and cutting each other in the 50s jump up in the 60s and did what they did? These Africans who were afraid of the police jumped up in the 60s and started shooting the police? We must put a stop to this. We say you can make no analysis of a people if you leave out the enemy. The enemy said, we must reduce these people to such a state that there will be so much internal chaos inside their community that once again they will beg the policemen to come back in. It's very simple. There's nothing complicated about the plan at all. As a matter of fact, if I were in their shoes, I would have to do the exact same thing. We say you must understand the enemy is a man and woman just like you. Any of you who think you cannot be Hitler, you understand nothing of human nature. You understand nothing of human nature. The enemy decided to pump in drugs, pump in drugs, pump in drugs, pumping guns, pumping guns, and cut down on revolutionary talk. Bring the culture, let the culture talk about shaking their butts and nothing else. But we strugglers have a responsibility. In fight of heightening oppression by the enemy, we must heighten our resistance. We strugglers have a responsibility. I remember the other day a brother came and said, Oh, hey, Brother Kwame Ture, remember me? I said, he said, I was out there with you in the 60s. I was out there. That's what you doing now. He said, well, I ain't doing nothing. I said, you should be shot. <laughs> I speak the truth. I know how desperately we need anyone who has any experience of struggle out here today. We need them more than we did in the 60s. And the beautiful thing about today is we got a whole lot who got a whole lot of experience. We have a whole lot who in their mentality and conception has changed. And once it's changed, it can never go back. We used to be afraid of the police. Ain't nobody afraid of the police no more. Starting with the young kids into whom they put the guns in their hands. You have to analyze properly the movement of the masses of your people, not what the press says. We say, these young kids are not afraid of the police. They're not afraid of anybody. They're totally indisciplined. But one good thing is that they've broken down all feelings of authority imposing itself upon them. There's nothing wrong with this. For us, it's a good thing. We must come to properly channel this good thing. So we want to make it clear to all, the problem is not guns. Indeed, if I were to tell my people to put down guns, I'd have to first start with the Ku Klux Klan. How many are asking the Ku Klux Klan to put down their guns? Not one. How many are asking the police to put down their guns? Not only are they not asking the police, the police are getting better guns. Look through every police force in this country. Do your work. You will see everywhere they give them advanced weapons, which kills better. And at the same time, telling us to put down our guns. If you believe in equality, it's very simple. You want me to put down mine? You put down yours. You put down yours. And we don't ask for much. Just ask the, just ask the Ku Klux Klan to put down their guns. 
Ask the skinhead to put down their guns. At least when you do that, we can understand. But you come to us and ask us to put down the guns? Look at Zania, South Africa. They kill about 30 every day. The revolutionary forces there ain't thinking about putting down their guns as long as the police got their guns because most of the violence in our community comes from the police. From the police. You can't make analysis leaving out the enemy. Who brings drugs into the community? The police. The police! Who receives tips for drugs? The police! Who receives bribes for drugs? The police! Who organizes the kids and gives them guns to fight for drug territory? The police! These are facts. And you talk about these kids and leave the police out there like they're our friends. We have to organize our youth. And the only ones who can organize the youth are the old strugglers who ain't afraid of nothing and who's grown better in their organizing skills. We are coming to our conclusion. We're going to take our time because we were the old folk. You know, our central theme, if you've ever heard anybody from the All-African People's Revolutionary Party speak, is organization. You've heard it. Matter of fact, the other day said, Brother said, oh, you're going to the slave, Brother Kwame? He said, yeah. He, what you going to say? The same thing I've always been saying. Right. You mean you're going to say the same thing? Yo, bro. Right. What you going to say? Get organized. Why? Because we ain't organized. Right. And since I know organization is the key, I ain't moving nowhere till we get the key. How right. you going to go open some door that's locked if you can't find the key? It's got bars behind it. You ain't got nothing. If you keep going up against the door, it's stupid. You're going to bang your head. Find the key. Especially since you know where the key is. If it's down in the well, get a rope, go down in the well, no matter what it takes, and get the key. Our people got to be organized. That's the key. No matter what it takes, organize the masses of our people. <laughs> when discussing the unity of our people, we must come to understand it properly. Brother the other told me, what you doing, Brother Kwame? I said, still trying to unite our people. He laughed. Our people ain't united. Ain't never gone. I told him, shut up. And for real, the Bible says you can commit a sin by thought, word, and deed. You can sin against your people by thought, word, and deed. If you think your people will never be united, you've just sinned against your people. I once told a brother joking, but joking seriously, he said, oh, Africa will never unite. I said, I can kill you for that. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> the enemy tells us every time Africa won't unite. Why do we need to say it? You must not give propaganda to the enemy free of charge. Nobody tells us we can unite. Everybody tells us we can't unite. We come to us, and we're the first to tell us, you know, we can't unite. You better go tell that crap to the enemy. Get out of my ranks. Africans are going to be united. <laughs> Brother told me we don't have any level of unity. I told him, keep quiet. Look at your people. Your people have unity of action. We lack unity of thought. But we have serious unity of action. I mean, you can go and have a little meeting somewhere. Look at the Universal Negro Improvement Association. They have their meetings everywhere. Six, seven, eight people come. But those who are faithful, understanding their responsibility, uphold their responsibility. That great son of Africa, Ahmed Sekou Toure, says, the best traditions of any people can at any given moment be manifested by all of them, a majority of them, a minority of them, or one of them. If you are the one representing the people's struggle, represent it with uncompromising dignity. They will come on the street corners and discuss, tell the people they need to get together. The people won't listen to them. One racist incident occurs, and without even the slightest discussion, all the people come together and rise up against the enemy. Look at Los Angeles. Here you have clear unity of action. If I went to Los Angeles 
The day before Rodney Kings was judged, and I said, look here, brothers and sisters, they're going to give the, they're going to let these pigs get away free. We got to organize. We need to get some guns. We need to get some Molotov cocktails. Oh, he's just talking. But the minute at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, when the decision went down, they didn't even listen to Malcolm, who said, after dark for even Stephen, they went into the streets at 3 o'clock. And an entire people who were fighting each other, cutting each other, discussing with each other, came together in a unified force and took on the second largest city in the greatest imperialist power in the world and made them bring their army in to suppress them. We have unity of action. What we lack is unity of thought. We are revolutionaries. We said we do not run from difficulty, we run to difficulty. The most difficult task we have is bringing unity of thought among our people. Unity of action, without guided by unity of thought, leads one actually into a reactionary position. Our people have unity of action, but this unity of action is usually triggered by an enemy action. For example, it's only when they have an incident in Howard Beach that everybody jumps up. Like if Howard Beach all of a sudden changed, it's the same thing. And after they jump up and make a little noise, after a while they just sit right back down and say, oh, Lord, please don't let them shoot nobody else while I'm alive so I have to go out there and make no protest. <laughs> please wait till I die. Yeah, shoot somebody else. I got to go out and march again in the cold. <laughs> yeah. So all our unity of action is the result of enemy's action. Rodney King gets beat up. What's new about it? Hey. I've been dealing with the Los Angeles pigs since I was in the Black Panther Party in the 1960s. And I know the pigs in Los Angeles. They are the most vicious that you can find any place in this country. They have in Los Angeles what they call a chokehold. The police puts it on you. You go and look and see how many people have been killed by the chokehold. It's your history. You're supposed to know it. And dig this. Tom Bradley was a lieutenant in the Los Angeles police force. That's where they grafted him from when they made him mayor. He knows about this chokehold, and I'm willing to bet you, if you will do a simple statistical study, you will find more Africans got killed in the chokehold when Storm Bradley was mayor than when Sam Yorty, a racist white man, was mayor. These are facts for all to see. The people in Los Angeles, these police, in first place, if you go out to Los Angeles, all the policemen look like they got to be over 6'2 and beefy and hunky and wearing these big boots like the Stapos and these helmets and all this big gun. When they stop you with all this stuff in it, they're supposed to tremble. And the Black Panther Party came to change all this. The police must bring the people back into being intimidated. They must do it. But this unity of action, which we have, can only come to stop the police at certain times for certain periods because it's spontaneous. A people will never win a war through spontaneous action. You can only win a war through planned action. You give me 100 organized brothers and sisters. And let us face 10,000 disorganized with the same weapons as Africa is my mother. We'll whoop them every time. Right. We'll whoop them every time, hands down. Kwame right. Nkrumah said, it is organization that decides everything. Right. And the fact that we are disorganized proves it because we decide absolutely nothing. Right. In order to have unity of thought, we must have collective thinking. One of the biggest problems with our movement is we got so many individual stars and superstars. They are not disciplined to any organization. Organization disciplines you. And we are an indisciplined people. If you are just a member of the NAACP, it's a nice spring afternoon. You want to go out and lollygag, but the NAACP has a meeting. If you're disciplined, you go to the meeting. You go to the meeting. How many of us can actually say that we, on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, go to meetings for organizations and help to push these organizations forward through collective thinking? It's not done. In most cases, most of our organizations don't even have political education programs built in the organization. 
I was a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. We had none. I was a member of the Black Panther Party. We had none. Absolutely none. Matter of fact, when I tried to bring it, oh, you just a bourgeois college student. That's right, Jack, and an honor roll student at that. <laughs> That's right. Not only that, Jack, I took philosophy and dig this. Everything I get, I give back to my people. Does it make sense to you that you are the leader of a movement? You have a thousand people who are following, and you're the only one who can see better than all these thousand and make that stupidity. One woman may be more intelligent than one man, that's a fact. But no one man can have more experiences than any of the two people. And it's experience that brings knowledge. Sit down and read a book with a stupid man. Let him read the same book. Come back and discuss it. He will show you stupid things to show you how stupid you are because you didn't even see it. As a people, we have no collective reading, no collective study, no collective thinking. This is our greatest error as a people. This is our greatest shortcoming as a people. This is why we can't even discuss who we are. Because somebody thinks they're black American, and that's what they think. And what I think is what I think. <laughs> like you think, you think, you can think. Half the time, they ain't even thinking, reacting to stimuli, and think they thinking. <laughs> Unless we do collective reading and collecting discussion, we cannot come to unified thoughts. <laughs> of course, the enemy will confuse you. Capitalist system will tell you, you can think, and whatever you think, that's it. Man told me that the other day. You African? He said, "I don't think that." I said, "You think you think it?" He said, "Okay, what you say? I ain't no African, and that's what I think, and what I think is right." I said, "Okay, please think that two plus two equals five. Think it." <laughs> no man, no woman is born with the truth inside of them. Not one. All of us come to acquire the truth by searching for it. First of all, we must even have a desire to know the truth. <laughs> Acquisition of knowledge is directly related to the desire for knowledge. If you do not desire knowledge, you will never acquire knowledge. Once you understand that your people are oppressed because they lack knowledge, if you love your people, you seek knowledge. If you love your people, you seek knowledge. Consequently, since our people lack knowledge, those of us who truly love the people seek knowledge. And we understand this knowledge cannot be individual knowledge, it must be collective knowledge. Unity of thought must come. We are concluding, but we want to give you, of course, the practical applications. We say what we always say. We will never tire of saying it because it's the truth. If you love your people, join an organization fighting for your people. Where is the problem? Go among your Italian friends. Ask any of them what organization you belong to in the Italian community. Before you finish, they will tell you. Go to your Irish friends where you work. Ask them what you do on Friday night. Oh, we have the 4-H club and we did it a boom. Ask all of them. They have their clubs. Ask African, what organization you belong to? I don't believe in organizations, man. I'm in a room. He think he said something great. <coughs> brother told me the other day, church going, man. I go to church all the time. I said, brother, why don't you join an organization? He said, oh, I said, join the NAACP. Oh, they just stealing your money. What about your preacher? <laughs> African group was collecting money to help in Africa. Man, I said, a man came to you, you give money? I said, yeah, I'm giving. He said, go and steal it. I said, it's my responsibility to give. It's my responsibility to give. They're going to steal it. It's my responsibility to give. He still didn't hear what I said. A thief will not make me irresponsible to my duty to my people, even if they're occupying the highest position among my people. It's my responsibility. 
It's my responsibility to do everything I can to help my people. And no one can stop me from doing that. And certainly not a dishonest African. Brother, join the organization. Oh, man, them organizations jive. They just jive. And you? You're the only serious one. You must join organizations. We will conclude by telling you that we want you to join the All African People's Revolutionary Party. If you don't join it, you join the United African Movement. If you don't join that one, you join the Nation of Islam. If you don't join that, you join Republic of New Africa. If you don't join that, the New African People's Organization, if not one, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. I mean, we got so many. And I haven't even named half of them. I didn't even talk about the African People's Socialist Party. I mean, I didn't even name half of them. Each of us should know every organization that speaks for us. I know the NAACP, its leadership, its political line. I know the Nation of Islam, its political leadership, its political line. I know the APSP, its political leadership, its political line. I must know this. They are fighting for me. And I know I'll not be free until I wage a fight. So anybody who's fighting for me, I got to see what they're doing. I got to know exactly what they're doing. I know exactly what the United African Movement is doing, and I'm sitting in Africa. I know what they're doing. So we'll end by telling you that you must join an organization, but before we end, since we were all these old strugglers, we know that you will not, uh, you will not mind if we just ego trip just before we sit down. So we just go, no, we don't ego trip much, but with you, we can ego trip. Let me tell you all now, I'm a bad brother. I'm a bad brother. <laughs> bad brother. I'm a bad brother. From the time I was 18, these pigs been shooting bullets at me, and I'm still catching them and chucking them back. Yeah. And when I was a young man, I was terrible. But now, I'm worse, child. Because when I was a young man, I thought we were going to win. Now I'm old, I know exactly how we're going to win. I'm bad as you get, Jack. They put me in prison and tortured me and I spit at them. I'm bad, Jack. They shoot bullets at me and I laugh. Bullets, you're not made for me. Go on, keep getting up. Yeah. But you know, as bad as I am, I have never been without an organization in my entire life. And I'm bad. I'm super bad. When I was a young man, I was in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I was expelled from the Student Nonviolent Corner Committee, but before I was expelled, I was a member of the Black Panther Party. This fact was made clear to me by the great Malcolm X. The enemy killed Malcolm X. The enemy, the CIA, not the Nation of Islam, killed Malcolm X. <laughs> Hollywood does not write your history. If you think capitalism lies all the time, Hollywood, Jack, they invent. I mean, they invent lies. All the pictures about Malcolm always makes it end as if the Nation of Islam killed him. Malcolm X was no fool. Malcolm X was a man of great courage and integrity. I have heard him and King criticize themselves publicly with severe language. If you will listen to one of King's greatest speech, and certainly no, I have a dream speech is not his greatest speech. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it's his most mediocre speech. If you know King, but you know, most of them don't even know King. Oh, yeah, I have a dream. What does he say? I have a dream. Well, I have a dream. I heard you. <laughs> even King got a little, 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 little speech that'll make you really go off. It's called a man who slept through a revolution. It's about Rip Van Winkle. It's rough. It's a little thing. But King in his speech on Vietnam, which is a rough speech, <laughs> and one I will never forget, and i just give you some history before I sit down. You know Martin Luther King was not the first one to come out against the war in Vietnam. We've already mentioned the position of the Nation of Islam. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee took an active position against the war in Vietnam. We were out there by ourselves. And I was the chairperson. Well, we would take, I mean, heat. They weren't playing, Jack. What? They talking about destroying the draft? I never forget when I was a young man. 
I was sent by Snicker to this big peace meeting. You know, they had all these big people like Dr. Spock, you know, Dave Dellinger, that I've been reading about. You know, I was just a little boy, and I came and sat at the table, you know, and I was a young student, and I was taking copious notes, and everything they said I was writing, and I didn't say one word. At the end of the meeting, they said, oh, but the representative Snicker's from here, and you have anything? Do you have anything to say? I said, oh, yes, I'm sorry, I forgot. My organization uh, wants me to tell you that we're going to destroy the draft. They said, what? So we're going to destroy the draft. No, you can't do that. Well, anyway, I'm just telling you what my organization told me to tell you. <laughs> like the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, I wasn't asking y'all. <laughs> yeah, they said it couldn't be done, but we were out there by ourselves. But we recognized that we had to pull King in. And we recognized that King was an honest man, a very honest man. And we recognized that King had a fundamental contradiction. Since he said that nonviolence was a principle, he could not advocate that we be nonviolent in America and not be nonviolent in Vietnam. The political contradiction was clear, crystal clear. We call all our stink people together, since all of us knew Martin Luther King and worked with him, and he was a humble brother, open to everyone. Nobody could be blocked from seeing him. He said, all right, everybody in SNCC. Every time you get up close to him, put the pressure on him. How come you tell us to be nonviolent here and not be nonviolent in Vietnam? We were whooping him. And King knew exactly where it was coming from. And the enemy was trying everywhere to stop him. You know, Dr. King, this is an international level. You're a domestic leader. If you get involved in that, it will cause this. I mean, trying to get him argued. We just kept bending him. One day, I'll never forget, I went to see him in Chicago, 1 o'clock in the morning. Brother in Mississippi had been killed in Vietnam. I want to give King the news myself. One o'clock in the morning, Dr. King, hi, hi, how you doing? Call me, I'm fine, thank you, sir. Come in, sit down, how you doing? Da, da, da. Talk a little while. Dr. King, you remember John Thomas? John Thomas, huh? Yeah. Oh, wasn't he that little one in Jackson that went to fight the police with nonviolence and I had to calm him down? Yes, Dr. King, that's him. You remember he wanted to fight the police and you talked to him and, get, and since then he's been disciplined? He said, yeah. Where is he, Kwame? I said, oh, he's dead, Dr. King. He's dead. What happened? He got killed. Yeah, where? In Vietnam. In Vietnam. Yes. What's it? Well, Dr. King, I think maybe he got confused. Maybe he tried some of your nonviolence there. <laughs> In revolution, there's no sentiment. He had to take the position, the correct position. We had to push him there, and we push him there with nonviolence love, but with firmness and with the truth. I'll never forget one Saturday night I was in Atlanta in the office. The phone rang. Oh, it's for you, Kwame Ture. Hello. Oh, I'm ready for revolution. Oh, Dr. Martin Luther King. How are you, sir? Fine. Kwame, what you doing? Oh, Dr. King, I'm working here Saturday night. It's about 10 o'clock. What you going to do after? I said, well, after about 12 o'clock, you know, I'm going to go get down in the Pink Pussycat. Got a nice nightclub around there. I'm going to get down. What about tomorrow? Oh, Dr. King, I got a lot to do. He said, why won't you come to church tomorrow? I said, well, I'd love to come, but really, I got a lot of work to do. He said, well, you know, tomorrow's the Sabbath day. I said, yes, but us heathens are not as lucky as you well, the Christian faith, we have to work on Sundays. I have a lot of dumb animals to pull out of a whole lot of wells. So, well, I want you to come to church tomorrow. I'm preaching tomorrow. Well, you know, I'm a heathen, Dr. King, but I must tell the truth. Every time you preach, I must tap my foot. But unfortunately, I really can't make it tomorrow. He said, well, you must come tomorrow. But honestly, Dr. King, let me come next Sunday. No, you must come tomorrow because tomorrow I'm making my speech against the war in Vietnam. None of us spoke for about 20 seconds. I said, Dr. King, I shall be on the front row. Hung up the phone. And even there are press clippings of it. You look at the press clippings, and his first speech was not made at Riverside Church. Dr. King always decided his policies in his church on Auburn Street. That's where he always gave his major speeches, and that was his speech. I was on the second row. When I'm on the first row, there were some sisters. I'll oh, leave them. We go on the second row. Yeah. In that speech, Dr. King said something. Of course, it's a great speech, and everybody should know the speech. You should forget this. I have a dream and see why I oppose the war in Vietnam. In the speech, he said something I never forget. He said, there's a time when caution can lead to cowardice. He was talking about himself. He was talking about himself. Dr. King and, Martin and Malcolm X had great courage to criticize themselves publicly. Malcolm said, I've attacked just about every leader out here. I've made a mistake. I'm sorry. I would like to work with all of them. Malcolm said it. Malcolm said it. I said, I've always been in organizations, and I'll never be out of organization thanks to Malcolm X. We said the police killed Malcolm X, and the New York police played a crucial role in killing Malcolm X. Right. 
I'll never forget those pigs where Malcolm put the Nation of Islam out on 135th Street and the police ran and ducked behind benches and death and all of Harlem cheered and laughed and rocked. The police would never forgive Malcolm X for that. The police killed Malcolm X. Malcolm said it himself. When your phone is tapped, the Nation of Islam cannot tap your phone. Only the police can do that. Only the police can do that. When you get followed to Cairo, Egypt, and you get poisoned there, the Nation of Islam cannot do that. Only the CIA can do that. When you get blocked from going to France, the Nation of Islam cannot do that. Only the pigs of the CIA are capable of doing that. I've been blocked from France too, and I'm not even a member of the Nation of Islam. It's the CIA that killed Malcolm. And they killed Malcolm when he was between organizations. A mistake I will never make. Malcolm left the nation and was in the middle of building two organizations. Malcolm was a giant. Malcolm clarified the problem carefully. He said, in the mention of Islam, there are two segments, religion and politics, based on nationalism. Let's separate them. He took Islam to Orthodox Islam. He took nationalism to Pan-Africanism. And while Malcolm X was in the middle of building the two organizations, the police said, if we don't kill him now, we are finished. They got him. Right. When I saw that, I said, thank you, Malcolm X. I will never be without an organization in my life. Right. Told a man the other day, I want you to join this audience. Oh, that's a bad organization. I told him, bad organization is better than no organization at all. All right. All right. All right. You are all strugglers here. You must give the best example to the youth. The only example we can give to our youth today is an organized community. All of you know what I say is the truth. Once we're organized, who can bring drugs into our community? Once we're organized, who can shoot anybody? Once we're organized, who can carry on antisocial behavior in our community? The only reason this can occur is because we are disorganized and make no steps towards organization, only to putting band-aids on problems. You must be organized. It is only organization that will lead us to liberation. You have this responsibility. Educate your people. Push them to Africa. Educate your people. Let them know that we have a responsibility to educate our people. And only we can educate our people, and it can only be done through constant organization. And make one thing clear to everyone, when you join the fight for your people, you join a fight for eternity. There is no resting place here. Like my father used to tell me, son, when I die, I will have enough time to sleep. While you're awake, work for your people without sleep. Thank you. Ready for the revolution.